Hello, hi, uh, my name is Martin. Thanks uh, for coming to my talk. I uh, will be talking today about uh, infrastructure as code uh, or forming, cl forming clouds on AWS. So just quickly to get this out of the way, who am I? I'm uh, Martin, I'm CTO at UserSnap. Um, I'm doing, I do mostly backend and DevOps work. Uh, UserSnap itself is uh, built as a self-service uh, SaaS product running in the AWS cloud. And if you're wondering what we're doing, uh, we uh, build a customer feedback software for other SaaS companies to quickly get customer validation and make confident product decisions. If you like what you heard today from me, you can follow me on Twitter or connect on LinkedIn or um, we're always hiring for people, so just contact me. Yeah, so usually when I, uh, when I hold a talk, I usually like to talk about the history of things. Uh, I, I like that and so yeah, let's start with the history. Uh, in the beginning, when we started with uh, web applications uh, and when we uh, talked about infrastructure for web applications, we usually, we usually only talked about single servers. So you may have uh, put your database on its own server and your email server on its own server, but usually uh, everything about your application was managed on a server level and not on a bigger level. And uh, yeah, so that it was like this for a very long time and in some context it still makes sense. If you work at a university institute and all you need is a WordPress for the website, then it's probably fine that to just have a single server. But of course there are some challenges that come with that if you do that. Uh, one of the challenges is what I like to call snowflake machines. Like you have the server, it's doing something and then oh, let me add this one thing and then oh, can you add this one other thing and then you add another thing and then you do this five times or ten times and two years later nobody knows really what is running on the machine anymore. And that makes it very hard to scale horizontally. So if you suddenly need three of those machines, it's getting more complicated and more complicated. And another thing that's also a challenge of this is that you have lots of implicit knowledge that you need. So you need to know that you are using Apache as your web server and not Nginx because otherwise you don't really know uh, where to look for the config. So we already, we, that's, those are all solved problems, right? You can just you write, a, you write a shell script that will set up your server or you use Ansible or any other tool. So those are all solved problems, but they are challenges that we, need, that we needed to tackle. But then something interesting happened. There were two revolutions or evolutions as you, will, as you want uh, that happened in the last decade or decade and a half. And the first one was cloud computing. So what, what did cloud computing really do for us uh, in, in, when talking about infrastructure? Cloud computing turned complicated infrastructure into just off-the-shelf commodities. Like in 2009, when I wanted to build a load balancer, I would need to provision a server and then I installed Nginx on the server and then I set up the reverse proxies and then I set up the firewall rules and all that stuff was manual and tedious work. Nowadays, when I want a load balancer, I just click in the AWS interface, I choose, I click, and I pay. That's it. Nothing else is done. Nothing else needs to be done. And that, that allows us many more things. Like we can do things that we were never able to do before. I mean, how could you do a CDN just on your own? It's, yeah, that is something that cloud computing allowed us to do. The other revolution when talking about infrastructure is containerization. What did containerization do for us in this regard? Well, it turned our application servers into dumb Docker machines. We, when I wanted to run a Ruby on Rails app in 2009 that creates PNG files, I needed to provision a server, I needed to install Ruby in the correct version, I needed to install libpng, I probably then needed to compile libpng with Ruby bindings again so it works, blah, 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 blah. I don't need to do that anymore. I just need to run Docker and everything that is in regard the infrastructure needs of our application is in the Docker file. I don't, I no longer need to care about that. The developers care about that, but I don't if I run the servers. So if you look back now at what we had before, we no longer have snowflakes machines. No snowflake machines. We're just running Docker and nothing else. That makes it very easy to scale. And there's no more implicit knowledge. Everything is explicitly described in the Docker file and that's all you need to know about the infrastructure for your application. But <laughs> what do we have now? We have a Snowflake infrastructure. Because three years ago, I clicked in AWS somewhere to add a load balancer. And well, 
yeah, if I didn't document it, then somebody has to find it somewhere. And uh, while the individual machines are now very easy to scale, it's very hard to scale the entire, your entire infrastructure. So I, we set up all this crazy infrastructure with CDNs and Route 53 and all that things. And now I want to do the same with the staging environment. Yeah, you're going to have a hard, <laughs> you're going to have a hard time doing that. And again, we have lots of implicit knowledge and it sometimes even gets worse because in AWS, for example, ah, you have different regions. And if you go to EC2, to the EC2 dashboard and you're in the wrong region, you don't see servers. Where are my servers? Ah, yeah, they're in a different region. So it, we just swapped out the problems. We, we went, we, we moved the same problems to a different uh, level. And yeah, so how are we going to manage that? Well, I have some requirements that I think are necessary for modern infrastructure tooling. So at first, all of our, all of our um, infrastructure tooling must be compatible with the cloud provider APIs. So all the bash scripts that I wrote five years ago that I used to set up my servers, I can throw them all away. They are no longer valid. Uh, everything should be declarative. I don't want to I don't want to describe how I want something to be done. I just want to declare what I want. To have. That's also a stark contrast to the bash scripts. The bash scripts were direct or a Docker file. They're explicitly showing what to do in what order. And here I just want to say, I want to have a CDN. That's it. It should be then potent. Whenever I apply my infrastructure, multiple times, it should always have the same result. It should be customizable. If I want to have a staging environment and a different domain, for example, I should just be able to configure that. The result should not be special. It should not be, it should not output a black box that I cannot look into. It should put out something that's normal in the, in the environment of my cloud provider. I sh it should be able to detect and deal with drift. Drift is when the current state of your infrastructure diverges from the state where it should be. You need to deal with that. If, if, if something is different from your infrastructure than you want it to be and you don't notice, it's probably not good. And the last, uh, the last uh, um, requirement is it should be versionable. That's what everybody loves so much about Docker when it came out, right? All my infrastructure is now in this Docker file. And if I add a line, there's probably a git commit message that explains why this was added. So this brings us to infrastructure as code. What options do we have? Well, there's tools that um, can talk to different providers, Terraform, Ansible Chef, this is probably a good, uh, a good call if, you, if you're like a consultancy or agency and you need to work with many different providers and don't want to relearn all that ag again and again. Uh, there's CloudFormation, which is what we are using, uh, which is basically just a gigantic YAML file that uh, contains all the information about your entire infrastructure. And uh, there's AWS Cloud Development Kit, which is pretty much... Uh, it's a domain-specific language, uh, DSL in TypeScript, that allows you to code your infrastructure and uh, then to synthesize uh, AWS CloudFormation templates from it. So it basically is just a front end to CloudFormation if you want to see it like this. So why did we choose CloudFormation? Well, we're a product company. That means we can just choose. We can just choose to say, all in on AWS, we like AWS. We don't really have any need now or ever to move to a different provider. So we just stick with what the platform allows us. And uh, why didn't we choose the CDK? Yeah, our current, the current platform that we work on sadly predates the CDK, so it was not available. But we, if I would do it now, I would definitely choose this. So let's have a look at the minimum viable CloudFormation template. So What's interesting here? So in, there's basically three, three bigger sections. The first one is the description, which is nothing really. It just says hello world. Uh, but the first part is parameters. So parameters are things that you, are parameters that let you define parameters that then show up in the AWS console uh, where you can input values. So this is for the, remember when I said customization is, is important. So that's how you would uh, how would how you would go to implement customization of your templates. You just add parameters that you can then change. And then the bigger part, usually the bigger part, are resources. 
So in this case, we uh, define a VPC, that's a virtual private cloud. It's like the most basic thing that you usually have in an AWS environment. And what's interesting here is it's, uh, um, we, don't, uh, do the, we don't show the how, we just show what we want. So we want the VPC with these properties and that's it, it's declarative. And what's also interesting is we use the, here the ref that we use here, we, that's the parameter that we, find, that we defined on top. So here you can use all the parameters and you can also use stuff that comes directly from AWS. Like for example, the stuff that is inherent to the stack that you're using, like the name for example. So that's the most basic, basic template possible. How does it look in real life? Well, it's a bit more complicated. Usually you have multiple stacks. Uh, so we have three stacks, I think. That means three different environments and templates. We have 69 parameters. We have 85 resources. And overall, it's about 2,000 lines of code, just plain YAML. So that's, uh, that's pretty hard to, to maintain at times. Yeah, and how does it look in, in, in reality? So if we take a look what we actually do with it. So once you have a template, the AWS, uh, you can, uh, in the AWS console, you can just apply your template to your stack. So if you already have a stack, you can choose to use the current template if you just want to update your parameters, or you can replace the current template. That's usually done when you add new resources. And then, if you continue, you then can, that's taken from our production interface, uh, from our production stack, uh, you can uh, um, uh, adapt various parameters. And if you're done with that, and CloudFormation will show you a preview of all the changes that you will do. Uh, what's also pretty cool about CloudFormation, it uh, auto-detects the, how, the, how the requirements are between the individual services. So in this case, we update uh, our Elasticsearch domain, and this in turn uh, updates the Beanstalk environment, and this in turn uh, needs, uh, uh, applies an update to all the uh, Route 53 records. And that's all done by CloudFormation. You don't need to do that yourself, that CloudFormation knows how the relationships are. That's pretty cool. And then you just press the big scary button and uh, then stuff happens to your infrastructure. <laughs> and you hope it works out. And it usually does. Yeah, so that was a very quick, quick intro. And uh, yeah, so in summary, what do we like about CloudFormation? Uh, we like that we got rid of all our Snowflake machines and Snowflake applications. There's just everything Everything that is needed to know about the infrastructure can be found either in the template, in the CloudFormation template, in the Docker file, or in parameters. Um, and that also means it's very easy to replicate. So it's very easy to just make a new uh, staging environment, for example. And of course, the best thing, it's free. Well, it's free. Uh, you still have to pay for all the AWS resources that you consume, but other than that, it's free. Yeah, and uh, let me just close with a few lessons we learned over the years while working with CloudFormation. So one thing is, really, you should use tooling to create your templates. So AWS CDK is great. Uh, uh, we use uh, Troposphere, it's called, because CDK did not exist yet. But it's really cumbersome and it's really easy to introduce back if you're just normally editing a 2000 line YAML. So use some tooling for that. Uh, also, it's very important you should have a staging environment, really. It's, if you're doing stuff to infrastructure, you really want to be able to try it out before you apply it to the, inf to the uh, environment that all your customers are on. Uh, what's also a good thing that we found out over the years is sometimes it makes sense to do stuff manually. Like if you want to be in complete control of what you're doing, uh, you can still do it manually and then the drift detection that I mentioned earlier kicks in. So if I update our database version and then I, up I update it in production and then later on I move the template to the next version, CloudFormation will just detect that it's already correct and not try to do anything stupid. And the last thing is uh, that's I guess true for every, every powerful tool in the world, starting with Cloud CloudFormation and uh, ending with uh, a circular saw, <laughs> uh, yeah, some things look innocent but are very, very dangerous. So 
remember the thing that we had before where we updated the, the Elasticsearch domain? Well, here the last uh, column says replacement conditional. Conditional means it might be replaced. So what does replacing mean? Replacing means it will throw away the old one, including all the data, and create a new and empty one. And because CloudFormation is really tidy and a good citizen, it will also delete all the automated backups that it did, because you, you're not going to need those anymore, right? So if you don't really pay attention to this thing, you can wake up with a really, really bad day. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a word of warning for that. Yeah. And last, uh, it's now behind my, um, behind the snippet. Uh, there is a way to uh, actually take care that so that this doesn't happen to you. It's called stack policies. That means you can protect important resources from deletion and replacement, which is, I would very recommend uh, to do. Yeah. And that's the end of my talk. Uh, I hope you liked it. I hope it was informative and uh, yeah, see you around. Thanks.